Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our one-on-one -on -one session. Here are our speakers, reporter, The Wall Street Journal, Amy Chozik, and head of TV department, WME, Rick Rosen. Hello, thanks for coming. Um, I know we're here to talk TV, but the Oscar nominations just came out, so I wanted to ask you to, your thoughts on, on some of those. Well, I'm just a TV guy. <laughs> So I'm a, a, uh, a, a fan of movies and slightly impartial to our clients. But, <laughs> but I think that you know, a lot of the nominations appear to be kind of what we all expected. Um, personally, you know, I think Social Network was a phenomenal movie and certainly deserving. You know, I, I worked very closely with Mark Wahlberg in the television business, so I was thrilled for The Fighter being nominated. It's a great movie. And, what Mark did to get that movie made was enormous, and I'm really, really proud of him. So all in all, pretty excited. Aaron Sorkin, you know, nominated for a Best Adapted Screenplay mm -hmm. for Social Network, another TV alumnus, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and so we're thrilled for him. But I think that shows you how um, the world has changed, you know, in, in film entertainment. When I started as an agent years ago, you know, you were, a TV guy or you were a feature person. And I used to talk to feature writers and he or she would say, I don't do television, I'm in the movie business. Now everyone's in everything. If you're a writer, you write. And you're a producer, you produce. And you produce television, you produce movies. And um, I think that's something that you can take away from this morning. Yeah, and you're seeing more and more film talent kind of migrating to television with Scorsese and Boardwalk Empire, and yep. I mean, is it becoming a more appealing place as kind of the economics of the film industry have changed? Well, I think that helps. I think, you know, that's the downside of, of what's the, the difficulties in the movie business these days. But clearly, it's hard to argue that the quality of writing on television isn't, you know, at an all-time high. It's fantastic. I mean, this, these are the golden, golden days of television in terms of writing. Um, and not just cable. Obviously, cable shows are fantastic. The one, Boardwalk and Mad Men, and lots of many, many other great shows and treatment. You know, that I'm involved with. But, but, um, but the quality of writing on broadcast television is superb as well. And I think it's all about writing. And when you're a writer and a storyteller, you know, television is a very exciting place to 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 work. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the ways uh, people are watching TV and how those are changing and how those changes in how viewers consume content is affecting your business and what you do? Well, this is a real pet peeve of mine. Uh, I think that if you talk to um, the research analysts at networks and studios and agencies, both talent agencies and advertising agencies, it's clear that more people are consuming television than ever before. More people are watching television. There are more hours being sent spent watching television than ever before. The viewers are consuming it differently. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, you know, when we started Endeavor 16 years ago and people got in front of a television, you counted them up and that was, and that was your rating. Um, today people are doing watching television while they're multitasking. They are DVRing in a very, very, very uh, high rate. People are watching television on a plus seven basis or they're watching sh certain types of shows. They're watching um, full seasons, half a season, six episodes, two and three weeks later. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't accurately reflect the ratings that the networks and the studios, and therefore my clients are, are getting paid on, doesn't actually reflect the people that are actually viewing it. So this is a problem, and I know that Nielsen's looking at this, the studios are all over this, um, but it's, you know, we need to have that catch up. We need to have the people um, who are watching television beyond uh, a, a C3 basis mm -hmm. being counted uh, and therefore um, you know, create more value for these shows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And talk about one of the, your clients that everyone's interested in, Conan, and how that is kind of impacting him and his, uh, all the ratings stories about his, uh, his TBS show. Well, it was very interesting. You know, when we made the, ana the analysis last year of where to, to take Conan's show, um, I think that most people thought, in fact, we expected and were in negotiations uh, with Fox, and we expected to go to Fox. Fox was clearly very interested in, in Conan coming over. 
Uh, and it was kind of the natural progression of his show to stay on broadcast and go to Fox. Um, you know, Fox had clearance issues because of the number of sitcoms that they had bought at 11 o'clock. So, you know, we would have had a lot of clearance issues for a couple of years. Um, and we were honestly thinking of, well, just fight through that. But the more you thought about it, you realize that ultimately rating stories would be coming out right now saying, you know, that our ratings compared to Jay and Dave and that whole thing would be so far in, so, uh, inferior, but no one would do the analysis or look beyond the fold that, well, we had 60% clearance and they have 100% clearance, 98% clearance. Um, so that was problematic. And then, you know, we looked at all different day parts. We looked at syndication. We looked at, obviously, clearly daytime. Um, uh, and then when the TBS people came in late in the game and made a presentation to us that kind of blew our socks off, um, and we looked at several things with TBS. One was the fact that the lead-ins to Conan were going to be more compatible with what his audience was. I mean, we knew from late night and from The Tonight Show that Conan's audience was significantly younger uh, than other late night viewer, uh, other late night shows, especially the ones on the big broadcast networks. Um, that was the whole analysis of Conan going from late night to The Tonight Show was to make The Tonight Show younger. Um, and you know, you looked at the lead-ins on TBS, and we're dealing with Family Guy, and we're dealing with The Office, and this kind of is this is his audience, you know, younger shows. Um, and then uh, you know, you compound that with the fact that their median age had already been significantly younger. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I think it was about 40 compared to uh, mid 50s, you know, at the broadcast networks. Um, and here we are. We're now been on the air for about six months. Conan's median age is almost uh, just under 34 years of age, you know, and not to knock anyone, that's not the point, of my, uh, the point I'm trying to make, but, you know, the median age of Jay and Dave are 55, 56. That's not Conan's audience. Uh, and now you look at how Conan's audiences are, are viewing the show, and TV has done a lot of publicity on this. They are, they are recording these shows, they are watching them online, and they're not necessarily watching them that night. They watch them in bulk. They watch them five nights in a row. Um, and when you look at a, at, a, uh, at a plus seven basis, his ratings are enormous. And I have to say that people at TBS have been just fantastic partners. Mm -hmm. Conan and, and his producer, Jeff Ross, are thrilled. And it's been a, just a, a fantastic relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you if TBS is kind of satisfied with those ratings and as a cable network, are they more patient about counting the downloads, counting the DVRs um, versus, you know, who won ratings night on broadcast? You know, it, it, it's the most uh, incredible thing that I, I think I, I've experienced. Certainly in speaking for Jeff Ross, uh, Conan's producer of 17, 18 years, you know, they keep saying to me, these guys can't be this nice, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, but they're beyond thrilled. and. TBS, uh, you know, are continually just could not be happier. They're they're thrilled with the numbers. You know, they want them to produce more shows. They want you know, whatever they want. They're just mm -hmm. they've been phenomenal partners. Mm -hmm. How can you change that mindset when the people who are watching in these new means are often the ones that are most valuable to advertisers? Well, this is part of the kind of metamorphosis that we're going on going through in television. You know, these younger viewers are multitasking. They are incredibly, these are the viewers that advertisers are seeking. Mm -hmm. We're looking at 18 to 34 year old um, uh, uh, audiences that are buying, that are creating buying trends uh, and are incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it, as everything else, the ratings systems need to catch up mm -hmm. to the viewing patterns uh, and to how the world is changing. It's changing very, very quickly, as we all know. And, um, you know, it is, the, to me, the most important issue facing television today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk uh, NBC Comcast. Obviously, past the regulatory hurdles, um, will be official any day now. Uh, give me your thoughts on the combined entity, and can uh, Steve Burke and Bob Greenblatt save the network? Look, I think you're looking at two people who understand broadcast television very, very well. Steve Burke, uh, obviously, his family came out of broadcast. Mm -hmm. His father's Dan Burke from Cap Cities, worked at Disney. He understands kind of, he understands what it takes to succeed in broadcast. Um, in talking to, you know, to him, to Steve, and, and to Bob, they're in, under no 
Uh, they're not delusional here. They know that this is not going to happen overnight. They know this is going to take um, several years, you know, to sort of turn this thing around. You know, my personal opinion is that they've got the right people in there mm -hmm. to try and do it. You know, uh, if you look at some of the pilots that Bob's been ordering and will continue to order, he's going to be sort of doing things that are a little bit different. He's going to try to shake it up a little mm -hmm. bit. He's a very smart programmer. Um, he's very well liked by the community in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I think you're going to find uh, basically the entire Hollywood community embracing mm -hmm. Bob and and wishing for his success. I won't get, believe me, I won't get all the answers and the, 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 that I'm looking for, but I know that I've got a partner there who understands what it takes to uh, to do successful programming. Mm -hmm. We've heard about the uh, Playboy pilot they picked up here, kind of Mad Men like period piece. Any others that are have already been announced that? you can talk about? Well, you know, he's, he, he's doing some things that he liked when he was at Showtime. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, he, he knows that he can't put a whole diet of that mm -hmm. on the network. He's going to have to do a couple of those shows. You're going to see him pick up sort of good, solid television shows also for a broadcast audience. Um, and, you know, he's just in the beginning of, of the throes of this and over the next couple of days, we're going to be start hearing about m a lot more of his announcements. That's interesting. I, I remember Jeff Gaspin telling me they w he wished they had a Dexter for broadcast. So uh, sounds like they might these days. They might. <laughs> um, um, something you mentioned that you're involved with that I thought was really interesting is kind of scouring the globe for interesting TV concepts and trying to adapt them to US audiences. Tell me which foreign markets are making the most compelling TV and what you look for. Well, it's really, uh, look, we obviously, especially you, you come to this convention now, it's not like it was 15 years ago. I mean, this is an international convention. Mm -hmm. And I find that very, very exciting. And um, we do an enormous amount of work with all sorts of um, content uh, creators around the world. Obviously, a lot of business in the UK. We, were, we um, have been in business with, uh, for example, the British company Hattrick for many, many years. Um, did Whose Line Is It Anyway years ago. We're going to do another version of Whose Line Is It Anyway probably for ABC this mm -hmm. year. They're doing, uh, there's a very successful British comedy on the, in the UK called Outnumbered. We have a pilot of Outnumbered being shot at Fox. So, and there are several other British companies that we represent, a lot of people represent. Mm -hmm. Those are the obvious ones. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I've had a fair amount of success over the last, I'd say, about five years with Israeli formats. Mm -hmm. uh, I sold in treatment to HBO. Um, you know, while not the highest rated show on HBO, it's a compelling show, can critically acclaimed, mm -hmm. um, great drama, uh, and uh, a well-talked-about show. We're shooting uh, a pilot right now uh, called Homeland uh, that's written by, uh, the, by Howard Gordon and Alex Ganza. We were uh, from 24. Um, Homeland is based on the Israeli series translated into uh, what's called Prisoners of War. And it's essentially about two American prisoners who were taken in Afghanistan and come back to the United States. And their stories aren't gelling. Mm. And someone's flipped, mm. and they can't really tell which one it is. Star the series stars Claire Danes as, a, uh, as an, a CIA investigator who's not buying this story. <laughs> Fantastic script. Again, the Israeli series was about an Israeli prisoner mm -hmm. taken in Lebanon. Um, and it's a great format, great format switch. Showtime is doing it. Um, we uh, have another Israeli uh, comedy going on the Fox network uh, in February called Traffic Light. So I think what that shows you, and by the way, we've done a lot of format uh, sales over the years, You know, whether it's Dancing with the Stars, Who's Line, The Office, Ugly Betty. you know. I think we're going to see a, a, a proliferation of formats mm -hmm. from the Spanish-speaking world. We embrace that. Um, and I think compelling television and compelling content comes from great creators wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. Of course, this makes me think of the new Showtime series episodes. Which is another <laughs> one that, uh, that uh, we're involved in. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hat trick show that is being produced with um, David Crane and Jeffrey Clarick, who were from Friends. It's a Hilarious. Great, great series, um, and it's exactly what, it's a satire <laughs> on what goes wrong when a Ford Matt can come over. It's a hysterical show. 
<laughs> casting Matt LeBlanc. Matt LeBlanc is Matt LeBlanc. <laughs> um, well, speaking of overseas, I wonder um, how important is overseas sales these days compared to syndication? Is it as big a chunk of, of the revenue generation? Well, I think it depends on you know on the series. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's incredibly important, especially with drama series that are ordered. I think the major studios um, are very, very dependent upon their foreign sale uh, to um, get the shows made. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know, a few years ago, it, you know, the foreign sale was often uh, gravy on top mm -hmm. of uh, you know of your license fee, and now it's really important just to get your series, you know, financed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, the market seems strong. It's, you know, um, and uh, we continue, to, the studios continue to um, be very active in that market, especially for dramas. Mm -hmm. Comedies as well, but dramas, it's, it seems to be more important. Mm -hmm. And do you think about international appeal at the very early development stages? I mean, how do you know a show like A House or a CSI is gonna have such huge foreign appeal? Well, honestly, you know, it's not our responsibility as agents mm -hmm. to uh, put that cart before the mm -hmm. horse. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our responsibility as advisors to talent is to make sure the talent writes something that they are moved by. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that show will have some value. Mm -hmm. More often than not, if, it, if something has absolutely no foreign value, it probably doesn't get sold at least to broadcast, it may right. get sold to cable. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I think I, we see our job as being supportive to the content creators, to the to the writers of these shows, uh, um, to make sure that their vision gets fulfilled and sold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A little bit more about the uh, economics of the agency model is: uh, are packaging deals as big as they used to be, even with networks kind of producing more of their own shows? Nothing as big as is as big <laughs> as it used to be, um, including this convention. But but. Um, and I think that's reflective of the market, frankly. You know, I, you know, we, my business has turned uh, much more into a volume business. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, with the proliferation of networks, um, cable networks especially, you know, my business has turned much more into um, making sure we get, a lot, sell a lot of shows mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and get those shows on networks, whatever the platforms are. You know, 10 years ago, we sold very few shows to small cable networks. Mm -hmm. Now we're sh selling shows to small cable networks, medium cable networks, large cable networks, broadcast networks, mm -hmm. um, and we just, we need to continue to, we really, you know, as a large agency, need to be more in a volume business. Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, we can open it up to some questions if people have questions. If not, we can... Keep talking. Yes, I look at there, Alex. Yes. Sir. Well, it's challenged for sure. You know, broken. You know, is if it was completely broken, we wouldn't be making these shows. Um, you know, retrans helps. You know, I think that one of the concerns that we have as suppliers, whether you're on the studio side or you're on the creator side, is to the extent retrans uh, can have a detrimental effect on your ability to have an aftermarket sale. Um, on the other hand, retrans can help you grow an audience. I know NBC with Harry's Law, David E. Kelly's new show, is retrans. Uh, retransmitting the show over the um, over the NBC cable networks, and frankly, I'm in favor of that because I think it'll help grow the audience. And NBC's distribution is somewhat challenged these days. So, to the extent we can get more people to sample that show, it has a better chance of staying on the air. Hi, hi. We have a production company in Phoenix, and we have a program that airs there that helps um, the market reach the acculturated Hispanic audience. We have a great program. We've, we've shot in high definition. We know we're ready for the next level. With, we've had the, the goal in mind to move beyond Phoenix all along, but obviously test market in Phoenix. We want to figure out how to, what to do next, and that's been the million dollar question that we've been trying to figure out here. Can you give any advice to a company like us? What type of show is it? It's called the Fusion American Life Latin Style. It's an English language 
the pitch line or the joke that we say is it's, it's like entertainment tonight, but for Hispanics or brown people. A very high definition, very sharp, and there's a, a strong journalistic quality to it as well. So it's essentially a non-scripted, uh, non-fiction show. Absolutely. Well, I think that, you know, uh, that is a market that ne is underserved. Absolutely. Especially, in my opinion, the male version, you know, uh, uh, of that audience. I mean, I, I think that uh, Spanish-speaking women are often well served by, you know, a lot of the telenovelas. Um, but the male audience seems to be more underserved. You know, um, we actually, one of our uh, agents who um, named Eric Rovner is here in this market today. He's having lots of conversations with, you know, sp Spanish language creators and, uh, and broadcasters around the world, and we should talk to him. Okay, and the difference with ours is it's an English language show because that's the fastest growing. Right, program. but it, exactly, but, but same it's the same thing, same okay. issue. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. And talking about reaching those young viewers, I think Univision's average age is uh, a lot younger than the broadcast networks. And, so. and look, and there are nights when they beat broadcast networks, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's an enormously uh, important market mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one that you're going to see, you know, us and, uh, you know, I think our competitors really trying to penetrate and get in business with and, you know, we, we're, we launched a show being, it was announced this morning called Father Albert, um, but we need to be all over this. It's a very important market worldwide. Our world is shrinking, and um, it's something that's really important mm -hmm. to service. Hey, Rick, how are you? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about over the top. Just your perceptions of the real threat of over the top delivery of content and then specifically, maybe you can also just elaborate a little bit more in that same theme about the future role that you see emerging distribution platforms like Netflix um, coming in and playing a role in terms of uh, in terms of uh, acquiring content. You know, I think that the Netflix Netflix of the world are incredibly important new partners for us. In, you know, in uh, you know as we move forward, um, you know. Their model is obviously one that makes the HBOs and Showtimes and other subscription services very, very nervous. But you know, from my perspective, they're going to be acquiring programming. Um, they're going to be creating an ability for to have some aftermarket sales for certain shows, uh, and it's a real. It's going to become more and more important as a real force. Some of these other um, over-the-top services and boxes. We're going to have to see how they develop. It's clearly in an evolutionary stage. Uh, I've seen some demonstrations of things that are, are fascinating. Uh, I think it's going to take a little bit of time to get the distribution out there, but clearly important and you know something that we need to keep our eyes on. You know, uh, the, to monetize that right now is harder for us. Uh, obviously, the traditional business still is you know, the money business, you know, you know, analog dollars, digital dimes is the, you know, the old expression, but it's going to change and we have to, we have to be cognizant of it and, and work to help develop it. Good morning, Rick and everyone. Uh, we have a show regionally in, in Florida. It's been on for eight years, six of which have all been shot in high definition. Uh, the content, is, if I had to describe it, it would be lifestyles of the rich and famous, uh, and extra, extra. But it's with the base of, it's Palm Beach Rocks is the name of the show. But it's uh, not just confined to South Florida, it's in, you know, she's covered everything from the VMAs and the CMAs to New York more than we know. Wanna, we're kind of backdooring into the U.S. you know market, other than just the regional, with foreign distribution having a lot of success there. What advice would you give? Because there's another hook to what I'm, uh, what well, we're going to pitch, but it's not going to be here right now because it's very, very different and it's a lot of, it's got to be explained. But what would you suggest as far as getting it out to the next level? Now that Nappy is in our backyard, it's going to be much easier. 
You know, I think you need to meet with, if, if your goal is to move it internationally, I mean, I think this is the market for you to be in and to talk to international distributors. I mean, I think that's your, your best bet to keep it moving. Um, and there are, you know, also smaller domestic syndicators that might be looking for a show like that. So you have to find the right size distributor, someone that is going to pay attention to you. The larger distributors will not, frankly. Any other questions? OK. Well, um, should I ask about Ari? Who's Ari? <laughs> Everyone's curious how much uh, your, your uh, colleague is like his uh, fictional entourage character. Well, <laughs> I want to remind everybody that the show is fiction, <laughs> first and foremost. I think it has been something that he's gotten a lot of fun out of, although his wife would not find it quite as much fun, uh, doesn't find it quite as much fun. But I think that, you know, it's that combined with his brothers, you know, working at the White House has sort of elevated him to this sort of kind of celebrity status. Those of us who have known him for, you know, 20, 25 years find it a little bit funny. But the one thing about Ari that I will say, and those who know him actually do know him well, is that there is no one more fiercely loyal. Um, there's no one that you'd rather be on your side in a foxhole with. Uh, and, you know, he's incredibly smart. Uh, I think he's provided a real vision, you know, kind of for this new combined company. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, and he's having some fun with the whole celebrity thing about it, <laughs> as long as we don't take it too seriously. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. All the things that travel light, firefly is in my Showing how to feel all right And you know that it saved me